Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today, we're joined by assistant athletic therapist for the Toronto Maple Leafs, John Geller. John is currently an assistant athletic therapist for the Toronto Maple Leafs. His role in the medical performance department is to assess dynamic movement competency in healthy and injured athletes. In conjunction, his aim is to tease out dysfunctional movement patterns, which may be limiting to performance, causing stress in other parts of the body, and or limiting recovery from an injury. John is part of a multidisciplinary medical performance team whose goal is to keep players healthy and performing at the top of their game. Prior to his time with the Leafs, John was a consultant athletic therapist with the Montreal Canadiens for three years, followed by two seasons as the head athletic therapist for the Hamilton Bulldogs in the American Hockey League. John holds a Bachelor of Science with a specialization in athletic therapy from Concordia University and a Master of Science in Health Science, Rehab, Rocky Mountain University. Today, I wanted to discuss with John his career, his responsibilities within the medical staff of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and return to play, the decisions that are made, how that's handed off to skill coaches and return to play coaches, and the goal of the medical performance staff in the National Hockey League. It's a great episode. Welcome in. Welcome to the podcast, John. Thanks so much for joining us today. Anthony, I appreciate you having me on. It's a real honor and I uh, really love what you're doing with this podcast. I think uh, there's going to be a lot of people that really benefit from the content that you're putting out. Thank you so much. It's, it's going to be an interesting hour. Uh, you and I talked a little bit off air about your job duties, what you do. And I wanted to start a little bit uh, with your story. Um, I'm looking over here at your bio. You had three seasons as a consultant athletic therapist with the Montreal Canadiens and two seasons as a head athletic therapist, um, excuse me, as a head AT, yes, for the Hamilton Bulldogs in the American Hockey League. How did those experiences, how did you, how did you uh, get working in high performance hockey? Well, it was, it's, it's an interesting story, Anthony. Um, my last year of university at Concordia, I was uh, lucky enough to be selected to do a clinical internship with the Montreal Canadiens, which was a tremendous learning experience for me. So I was lucky enough to be surrounded by really bright, really passionate, um, driven professionals uh, that I learned from daily. And in fact, uh, one of my university professors, an athletic therapist and osteopath, consulted with the team. So there were days where I would work with him at the practice facility in the morning and then in the afternoon um, go and have a lecture with him. So wow. it was kind of full circle situation and, um, you know, still very close with those guys to this day and, um, you know, see them often and speak with them often as well. Um, so as I mentioned, I was lucky enough to do my clinical internship. And then from there, once I graduated from Concordia, I was certified as an athletic therapist in Canada. And um, following my certification exam, uh, Graham Reinbend, who's the head athletic therapist uh, there still, you know, called me and asked if I was uh, interested in, in continuing some, some work with them. So I, absolutely. So, you know, from there, I was going back and forth between, um, it started off, you know, uh, helping them out on, on game nights. And it, and it progressed as, as my experience and, and my skill set progressed to um, taking care of players or helping take care of players while the team was away on the road. And uh, my last year there at the end of the season, uh, there was a job opportunity in, in Hamilton as the head athletic therapist. And uh, um, I was uh, asked if I was interested in applying for the job. And, and I was, and uh Again, I was lucky enough to be uh, to be chosen for that role. And uh, again, what another great learning experience to kind of be thrown into the fire and surrounded by, you know, a great staff, coaches, um, equipment managers, uh, really everybody there uh, was was very impactful for me um, from a personal and a professional standpoint. And uh, I look back very fondly on my time in Hamilton with the Bulldogs and um Following my, my time with the Bulldogs, um, uh, I was approached for an open position with uh, the Maple Leaf as the assistant uh, athletic therapist. And again, I was uh, uh, interviewed for the job and was lucky enough to be um, uh, to be elected to uh, to that position. So uh, that was uh, seven years ago. It, it doesn't feel like it's been that long, but uh, you know, time flies. So 
Very unique. I, I like uh, what you said there at your your early stages, at least with Montreal. What a unique experience. You had the best of both worlds, really, right? Like you had the tangible applied experience and then you had the classroom room lecture. Did you did you see as a, as a therapist at that time, you know, these two worlds? You mean, sometimes there's a world of theory and sometimes there's the real world. Uh, sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. Did, did you see that? Uh, did you learn that as you went? Uh, how, how did you, how did, how did that, uh, how did those two worlds evolve for you? I mean, it was, it was this just, it was this unique time for me in that I was still developing and still trying to figure out in what direction that I wanted to go in with this athletic therapy, whether it was more on the clinical side, you know, in years prior, I had experience as a strength and conditioning coach. Um, so it was more on, on that side of things. And, um, you, you know, over the years, uh, I found that I was able to, merge both. Um, and, and that's really where I'm, you know, very passionate, um, yep. to this day, uh, about, but at, at the time it, it was, you know, as you mentioned, there's, you know, there's a perfect world and, and then there's the real world yep. and also there <laughs> we're quite a bit, uh, quite a bit far away, but, uh, you know, to have this unique experience where, um, you know, to get the theory and then to see it in practice was, was invaluable. And, uh, you know, I, I look back, as I mentioned, really fondly on there and appreciate all of the mentorship that I received from uh, everybody who worked there. You know, I, I don't take it for granted. And, and uh, that's why I mentioned that I'm, I'm still, you know, close with all of those uh, gentlemen to this day. Your current appointment. So assistant athletic therapist, Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, what are your current responsibilities? What does a day look like for you typically? Do you want the short answer or do you want the long answer? <laughs> short and sweet like my hairline. <laughs> Join the club. So uh, I, I, I laugh because uh, I think if you asked any athletic therapist or any, you know, uh, professional in, in, in professional hockey, uh, they, they'd probably give you the same answer where, you know, on paper you have your responsibilities and then, um, you know, what you actually do, there's quite a bit more, but I would say in a, in a nutshell, my responsibilities are really multifactorial, but they center around injuries. So specifically acute, um, you know, I aid in the management of emergency care of on ice injuries during games practices, or it could be in the gym. Um, and then, you know, throughout the course of the rehabilitation process, you know, with uh, long-term long-term rehab. And, and as I mentioned before, uh, where I'm really passionate about is this world, uh, between, you know, the medical clinic and, and the gym and, uh, um, acting as a conduit between the two. Well, well, I, I wanted to ask you and kind of parlay that question, uh, and piggyback it. I was going to ask what, whether your jobs change pending time of year, but I want to hit on one area that I'd like you to expand upon if you're able specifically the, the preseason. What, I mean, I would imagine there's an Intel, you, you guys come in, uh, there's, there's testing, uh, there's right now is, is, is training testing and testing training, meaning are, are, are there measures that are taken as baseline should injury occur or is the testing just physical outputs? I, I don't know if you can get into too much detail about that, but do you, how do you build baselines preseason? Well, it's, it, it's a process and, uh, we're, we're fortunate, um, that a lot of, um, a lot of athletes train with us over the summer. So we can collect, uh, data over the course of the summer and, and really build a book on, on each player, but specifically for preseason and training camp, I, I manage the functional testing. So we've been doing the functional movement screen and uh, Y balance testing for, for years now. And uh, we, we really appreciate the information that that gives us. And, you know, I, I view it as an opportunity to ask more questions. And um, it, if you look at it that way, I think it's, it, it has a lot of value. And, um, you know, it, it provides information that each, each faction, um, each member of our you know, department can use in, in their own domain. I think the Y balance is really important. Uh, we use that in years past. You get a really good idea of uh, the, the relationship between uh, 
the femur and the acetabulum, whether it's the internal rotation and external rotation. Is that something that, that is, is done just in preseason? Uh, do you guys revisit those numbers? Um, and is it the athlete competing against themselves or is that something where you collect it as a baseline and see where they're ranked in terms and measures of, of the team collectively to see what needs to be worked on? Yes, to both. Um, so it depends what we find, um, you know, from the initial assessment, but specifically what we're looking for is pain or significant dysfunction. And as I mentioned, it's, it's an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper and to ask more questions and to um, investigate further. So if we notice that, uh, we'll, we'll call it a red flag, if there are any red flags from this, then um, we'll investigate further. And uh, yes, we'll, we'll reschedule a reassessment for that particular player. I think the information is, is only good if you, if you follow up on it, because as you know, um, you know, there's a multitude of reasons why the player might have not tested as, as well as they could have on that particular day. So we retest to see if there's, if, if it was an anomaly or if that's, if that's their, their true norm. Communication. Wow. I had the opportunity in preparation for our, our uh, talk. I mean, massive staff, which is fantastic. Wow. 12 individuals on your medical staff. And I want to just, so I, I, I don't want to speak out of context. There's a lead doctor, director of high performance, head athletic trainer, two assistant, I'm saying athletic trainer, athletic therapist, two assistant athletic therapists, two strength and conditioning coaches, one massage therapist, one sports scientist, one dietitian, one orthopedic consultant, one team dentist. Now, I know there's a lot of cooks in that kitchen. I know they're not all in the kitchen. How do you communicate? Is it weekly? Is it daily? Is it a team staff briefing? How is communication assembled within that medical team? Well, first of all, I'm extremely fortunate to be a part of such a collection of extremely talented, dedicated, and passionate professionals. Uh, so I think that's the first thing, you know, for me is that you're, you're in an environment that, um, forces you to, to be better, to want to be better every day. And it challenges you in a good way. And, and that's so conducive to both growth individually, but as a group. And then the second part, as you mentioned, communication is, is paramount. It has to, it has to happen often. And it has to happen in different ways with, you know, so much going on um, with all the players that we have and, and the staff. So we meet, we meet every morning um, to get set for the day. And we have, you know, following that, you know, informal meeting throughout the course of the day amongst various members of the staff, just to update on, you know, a player's status or, you know, their, their work with a particular person to make sure that, you know, we're all on the same page. And uh, there's often formal debriefs at the end of the day, but we have our internal, you know, database that we uh, collect and uh, place information in that uh, all members of the organization can access. Um, and we also have our uh, league mandated uh, electronic medical record keeping system that, um, you know, the medical information gets um, placed in. What a unique environment. Uh, I love this fact that you're able to work around really, really smart people and lots of really, really smart people. I think Richard Feynman, a, a physicist, once said, I love the quote, I would rather have questions that can't be answers than answers that can't be questioned. I think that's that's how it went. I guess the uh, sum it up. How is a decision reached? Uh, is it, is it collectively everybody does if someone, you know, if someone's vehemently disagreeing with something, is there a lot of questioning? Is there a lot of critique? Who makes the final decisions? It's a, it's a collective really. So it's important that everybody knows or everybody feels like they have an opportunity to provide input. Everybody has their own unique perspective or lens that they look at, you know, things through. So that's why we have these meetings. That's why we have these informal discussions where people are able to voice their perspective or their opinion. And, and, and it's done so in a safe space. Do we have disagreements from time to time? Absolutely. You know, I think I'd be lying to you if, if I said that we, you know, we agreed every time, but I think that's important. It's done from a, uh, a respectful place, um, 
and not malintent or, you know, any other reason. But when we all leave the door, everybody's on the same page. Um, so in terms of decision making, it is, like I said, it's a collective, uh, but that gets done through, um, the, you know, the leadership group, the leaders of our departments, whether it's the head athletic therapist, the director of high performance, the uh, medical director, you know, they're the ones that would give the final say, but we've all had an opportunity to provide our, our opinions or but Got it. Uh, and then in turn, with the communication piece, final question to, to piggyback on that. Uh, how then is the message communicated to management of the players? Is it one voice? Or is it per department? How does that work? It's, it's one voice. Uh, so as I mentioned, typically it goes through our head athletic therapist or our director of high performance or our medical director. I think it's just, it's easier that way instead of there being multiple voices, it's, it's one, you know, or a few voices. Got it. Return to play. You and I, I know you're super passionate about this. Um, you know, we talked about it off air a bit, but w when it comes to return to play, and I get it, it's going to be context specific. So perhaps I need to drop a, a, a case study for you, but let's just say it's a lower body injury and it's a return to play parameter. What are the first touch points from an organization, uh, organizational standpoint, uh, standpoint regarding that process amongst the medical staff? How does that work? An athlete goes down, taken off the ice. It's a lower, lower body injury. That's a great question, Anthony. And, um, it, it, it's really done by committee. Uh, so typically what happens is when the player comes off, um, we'll escort them into the medical room or to the doctor's office. And depending on what the injury is, either myself or, uh, our medical director or our team orthopedic surgeon will uh, go through an assessment and then from there, we come to a consensus along with the player's input, which is very important um, about whether they're fit enough to return to the game or return to the practice. Um, and from there, that information is communicated back to the bench, which then gets communicated to the coach. And um, our medical director is um, communicating that decision to management. Wow. So there's, there's many layers, obviously. And if, if, if this is a situation where the athlete is not returned, perhaps it's an MCL grade two strain, then that athlete would obviously be instructed to come, uh, obviously off the ice and then essentially start a physical therapy, uh, appointment with everybody in terms and measures, talking about that player in terms of when that athlete would be able to, to get to the strength and conditioning or when that athlete would eventually be returned to the ice. So it's a systemic team approach. Am I accurate when I say that? Yeah, we, we triage it. And, um, you know, it's, it, at the end of the day, we want to do what's best for the player in terms of protecting them. Um, and, and we want to do what's best for the team. So, you know, we, we have to undertake a fairly robust, uh, yet concise assessment where we can get to the answer quickly in that, are, is it safe for them to return to play or not? And, and from there, it you know, starts a cascade of events um, in terms of um, what the next step is. You know, uh, do we need to provide further protection you know, for the area of injury or are they safe to return to play as is? Um, and if they're not returning to play, okay, well, what can we do to get started to, to begin the healing process to take the next step? Sure. Heuristics, rules of thumb. We talk this about this a lot in the podcast. And, and I think that comes from years and years of experience. And, and I'll, and I'll give you an example uh, of heuristics. We, we, uh, this idea of this fast and frugal tree where you essentially have, it's stop and go rules or, you know, for example, the athlete has a lower quadrant injury. A is full range of motion achieved uh, or passive range of motion. No, he's still in the IR. Yes, on to the next step. Is active range of motion achieved? No, on the IR. Yes, next step. And then it might be a, a force plate assessment. Then it might be skating. Then it might be trimp or whatever it may be. Are there any fast and frugal trees or decisions like that that you guys have created amongst your staff? I'm not expecting to give away secrets. Or are there any heuristics or rules of thumb that you guys have used to assess injury or uh, essentially uh, take that athlete to the next level in terms and measures of return to play on the ice? Great question. I think you and I could probably sit here for hours uh, talking about this. I, what I will say about injuries, as you know, is that they are complex. And 
need to be treated as such. So there is a very robust process that you have to undertake after an injury to outline potentially, you know, what the risk factors were involved and how much weight each one had, because that's going to help shape your return to play process. And then from there, you know, we, one, one big heuristic that, that uh, we live by is treat the athlete, not the image. So if we get imaging, sometimes the image is potentially different from what we, um, you know, as a group expected, but that we don't let that shape, say, um, the return to play process. Um, you can't ignore it. Don't get me wrong, but we, we don't, we try not to let it change that much. And, and, you, and you're treating a person you know, which is, again, is a, is a complex uh, system that doesn't have, you know, an easy solution to it. And it's not an easy answer. So examining all of the factors and all of the co-determinants that uh, potentially were involved in the injury. And then um, a big one is just working your way backwards, working your way backwards from the end product. What, what do they need to do? Where are they at? And um, how to get them there as as safely as efficiently as possible. So you can you can have a multitude of different injuries or the same injury, but you're gonna you're gonna treat it differently based on the athletes that, that's in front of you. And that's not just amongst you know different sports, which you know is apples apples to oranges, but uh, from player to player, even if they're the same position, right? And, and and you're getting all of that information from the the data that you've collected on them the treatment all the treatments that you've done your your baseline testing you know their their preference as as an athlete um what the research is saying um what your preference is um what your experience is as a practitioner um so there's there's a host of of, of factors that play into you know how the return to play process is fall out so we i guess we use a combination of uh, timeline based um, approach and a criteria based okay. approach, you know, there, the, the tissue, uh, where the area of injury has to undergo the healing pro has to complete the healing process right? for the most part. So you can't completely ignore that. However, you know, looking at it, at, at the person from a holistic standpoint, you know, there's, there's criteria that we need to see to progress through each stage of, of the rehab. And, um, again, working your way backwards from, from the end, um, and, and building from there. I really like that heuristic, treat the athlete, not the image. I think that's fantastic. Equipment, I, I kind of want to get off, uh, we're talking about injuries and, and, and athletic therapists, equipment managers, I'd imagine, have a really important job, right? If this is an, an injury that the athlete can get back to. Uh, we talk about this idea, um, fantastic book called The Physics of Ice Hockey by Elaine Hesch. I recommend it to anybody um, that uh, wants to kind of geek out with physics and ice hockey. And one chapter he talked about impact, the role of equipment. Essentially, force of impact is proportionate to the change in kinetic energy, which we move very fast on the ice because of minimal friction, divided by the deformation distance. So if we can spread the impact out over a larger surface area, whether we're trying to prevent concussions, whether we're blocking shots and, and defensemen have uh, extra padding, how how uh, is that something that's that's constantly evolving behind the scenes in the National Hockey League? I'll tell you what, the, the technology in regards to the equipment and the technology that the equipment managers utilize has grown exponentially, you know, in my 13 years in professional hockey. And that's an area that I feel like as medical professionals, strength and conditioning coaches, we can really tap into. How does the athlete interact with their environment? It's such an important subject that I feel like we're only scratching the surface with. If you look at other sports, like for example, car racing or biking or speed skating, they're, they're so in tune with their equipment. You know, race car drivers are changing their tires based on the track, based on the weather, you know, same thing with bicycle racing and uh, speed skating, they're so in tune with their equipment, with the ice, with the conditions and constantly changing. I, I, I feel like we can maybe take from those sports and, and tap into, 
the resource or further tap into the resource we have in, in the equipment managers and utilize their expertise to, to help us with, you know, performance and, and injury mitigation. Uh, absolutely. I think we had an interesting conversation too um, with Peter Friesen. I was talking about even the importance of the skates. Well, you know, coming back, he was talking about coming back from hip related injuries or groin related injuries. You know, what what's the hollow of the skate? Is it a half inch hollow? Is it five eighths? Is it is it a flat skate? Well, uh, depending on your 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 time in rehab, perhaps you're getting back on the ice for the first time, and and you don't want to use a lot of stick in the ice, right? You you want to rely less on your eighty doctors if if you're coming back. Maybe it's a flatter hollow. Very interesting talk, but again, taking the equipment. Uh, manipulating the equipment, whether it's return to play or protective wear, concussions, block shots, et cetera. Again, I'd echo your comments on that. I think that's going to be something that we continue to evolve in the future. And and we're we're extremely lucky with our staff. We have excellent, you know, excellent equipment managers that have a wealth of wealth of knowledge, wealth of experience that we can draw on. And I think it's really incumbent on us to to learn more. And then, you know, to be able to give them information that, you know, would help shape, you know, their work in their department. And as you mentioned, the skates are, are crucial and uh, manipulating hollows and the ever-changing conditions of ice, you know, in your own facility and going from, you know, city to city and, and having those conditions change. It's just, it's uh, to me, such a fascinating area. Um, and, 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 you know, somewhere where you can potentially tap into in order to, uh, improve, uh, performance and mitigate injury. I'm going off on a tangent here now, but what the heck you and I are just chatting back and forth. We had another one that Pete talked about. It was so interesting. He said, Anth, we we're talking about, um, I forget, I, I don't know if it was, uh, in Carolina when he was talking about it, it was a, a colleague of his, they were having concussion issues. And he said, he said, uh, he, he recommended that look at the actual stiffness of the boards. It goes back to that force of impact. He, he said that they had the stiffest boards in the league, right? C- changing kinetic energy over deformation distance. If you don't have much give on the boards, <laughs> you can manipulate the environment. And, and I'm not suggesting that was the root cause, by the way. I know it's a complex game, but it's a very interesting take on uh, using equipment uh, to both reduce the chance of potential injury and for performance enhancement. No, it's uh, absolutely. And it's important to consider all those. And, uh, you know, we, we had a goalie years ago that uh, had a history of uh, meniscal issues and, uh, you know, from time to time it, it would flare up. And, and as you know, uh, for meniscal issues, you know, torque going through the knee is, is, uh, you know, a no, no. And we, we finally figured out that, um, he was trying to utilize a long, sharp blade as opposed to one with a little bit more or a lesser radius, um, sharpening. And, uh, when he, when he switched back to the one that had, uh, more curve in it, he felt fine because he could pivot better. Whereas the long, flat, sharp blade, uh, there was much more torque going through his knee, you know, which for a goalie, they want to be able to uh, move side mm-hmm. to side quickly. So from a performance standpoint, it was advantageous, but from from his, you know, injury history standpoint, it, it was the, the, the opposite. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So again, looking at uh, uh, the, the the Toronto Maple Leafs staff, now we're talking again, return to play, getting close to back to game shape or game ready. And we have eight individuals on player development. We have two skills development consultants and one skill development regarding return to play. And uh, so, so this is a, a, a skill development and return to play expert. So I'm guessing that that individual is responsible for those or for that, that bridge. So my question is, how do you integrate these services during this process? This individual who is the quote unquote skill development coach slash return to pay, play specialist, is that a, how, how is that handed off? Again, if we're going to use an example here, hypothetical athlete, second degree meniscal sprain, he's coming back. We're, we're lucky to have our, our skill development and the return to play staff, you know, around all the time. So, you know, they're well aware, again, the, you, the, this piece on communication 
is vital. Um, so they know ahead of time, you know, what they're, what they're looking at in, in the coming days. And we try and brief them on what to expect. And um, they're in a unique situation in that they know what the demand of the player, you know, when they return to, to play are going to be, whether, it, you know, from, you know, a tactical standpoint, um, how are they going to be utilized by the team? Are they playing, you know, are they playing on the third line, fourth line? Are they getting a lot of ice time so they can work backwards from there? But it's just this constant flow of back and forth um, information that um, we provide to them and they provide to us. And, you know, it's a graded, it's a graded process. So again, it's a criteria based where the, the first day they're on the ice, you know, they're not, uh, they're not doing end to end sprints. It's, it's more of a leisurely skates just to get a, get the feel back and, and their edges. Uh, and then we, you know, progress from there. This idea of, 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 again, bringing this athlete back, hypothetical athlete on the Toronto Maple Leafs roster back, are there external metrics that you use and internal metrics that you use to guide the skill development slash return to play consultant? Is it something like, uh, I know we talked to, to, to practitioners uh, talking about GPS, using external load to quantify volume, getting progressively closer to on ice game situation. Is it internal load, trim, trim per minute to quantify internal load metrics where you use a little bit of an objective slash subjective approach? We use both of those to be honest with you. And that's really where our sports scientist uh, comes into play. And he manages all that in conjunction with our director of high performance. So um, we want to make sure that, you know, we're returning the, the athlete in, in a graded, you know, process and, and in a logical fashion in terms of, you know, increasing their workload gradually as opposed to you know spiking them too too early or you know underkicking them in the sense that uh, we're not providing enough workload but that being said you know obviously it's a constant communication between us and and the athlete to get you know their their perceived exertion and and how hard they think the session was and you know when they might think they need to back off or need a day off and um, all of that is taken into consideration it's a fine balance, isn't it? The way I look at it. Uh, number one, I mean, chances are that return to play skill development expert is a content expert at what would be needed for on ice, for example, game situations, read and react drills, changing the environment for the task. At the same time, your sports scientist is probably looking at metrics that, you know, whether it's external load, internal load to try to communicate and offer his or her advice when it comes to workloads. From your experience uh, in high performance hockey, it doesn't have to be with the Maple Leafs, but with high performance hockey, as a data analyst, as a athletic therapist, are you using objective information with the skills coach or the head coach to inform or persuade? Is it more, hey, this is information that I think is helpful? Or are you really trying to sell them and say, hey, you know, we've got to get this workload for this skate because, uh, you know, X, Y, Z game said it, uh, you know, that we need to work at X, Y, you, you see what I'm saying? Informing versus persuading. How is that working? Uh, the key word that you said is informing. So, you know, as I mentioned, our sports scientist and our director of high performance do a wonderful job of really before the season starts looking ahead at, at the calendar to, to where there might be periods of the schedule where we might need to back off. And then obviously monitoring that over the course of the season and the season, uh, excuse me, and, and providing that information to the relevant stakeholders to help them inform their decisions um, in their various, in various regards. Um, it, it's not to replace their intuition. It's, as I mentioned, just to help them inform their decisions um, on a daily basis. Absolutely. I think that's important. I, I think um, I think they both play, a, a, obviously, the subjective slash objective both play a critical role. I, I would have to be biased on the fact that I would I would use the same word. It would be more of an informed, you know, using those numbers to, to give a little bit of context to what's done on the ice, but letting the content expert, you know, do his or her his or her thing, if that makes sense. Regarding the final return to play decision. So, again, fictitious athlete Toronto Maple Leafs coming back from an MCL. 
that final decision is the athlete brought into the room. Hey guys, you're playing next game. Hey, we've, we've, we've tracked this, this, and this, you've got your report card. We've made these, this, and this based on our baseline numbers. How does that final decision get made? I feel like if your, your return to play process is robust and all of the relevant stakeholders have had an opportunity to provide input, uh, whether it be through hands-on work or work in the gym or on the ice, the decision almost gets made by itself, if that makes sense. Obviously, there are external factors that play into that as well. And at the end of the day, the athlete needs to feel comfortable that they are able to return to play at a high enough level that they're not risking, you know, re-injury. Um, but as I mentioned, if, if your process is, is detailed and robust, most of that is, is left. Understood. Yeah. So a uh, uh, comprehensive knowledge i think uh, i wanted to ask you now we could we could use athletic therapist we could use physical therapist we could use sports scientist we could use strength and conditioning coach so i want to paint the broad brush stroke uh, opinion based question of course do you feel a comprehensive knowledge of the technical and tactical aspects the biomechanics of the sport is important it doesn't mean you had to play at a high level but do you feel that that it's incumbent to have a high level understanding of the game to work in that kind of an environment? Quite simply, yes. Well, I think it's, I think it's everything. I really don't know how you can best serve the athlete and your colleagues without having that comprehensive knowledge. Com context is, is everything. And as you mentioned, it doesn't mean that you have had to play the game and, you know, not implying that you need to know um, your team's, um, you know, set plays off of, face-offs from a tactical standpoint, but in order to inform your area of work, I think it's, it's crucial. And if you don't have a comprehensive knowledge of the biomechanics or tactical, there are, you know, there are plenty of people around that, that do. So, you know, put your ego to the side and ask questions um, because you can gain a lot of information from coaches, players, especially. Um, from equipment managers, um, from really anybody that's around. Um, so, um, yes. Yeah, I, I would imagine also too, I would imagine this environment too, that, 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 uh, high performance players and now even the landscapes change with the younger athletes. Everybody wants to know why they're doing something. And, uh, you know, if you're not able to answer that, why that's fine. Go find the answer, admit it, be humble enough. But you're, you're, you also can be a shark in the water of blood, right? If, if you're, if you're BSing or you don't have a good understanding of that t context and you don't have a good answer as to why you're doing things, you might lose that one opportunity to build that buy-in or the trust, whether it's a system, whether it's a technology or whether it's a manual technique. And trust is everything. You know, because the second you lose it, it's it's extremely hard to get back. And, and and hockey, as you know, is such a hard sport. A lot of times players have a difficult time comprehending what they're doing off the ice and how it's going to transfer to on the ice. So the more you can bring it to their world, the better buy-in you're going to get, the more trust you're going to build, and you're further, you're further for it, you're further ahead for it. Absolutely. I want to pivot a little bit. I want to talk about uh, this high performance model. Obviously, um, the Maple Leafs, uh, I would I would go on a limb and say in terms and measures of resources and, and the model that they're implementing would be one of the top teams in the National Hockey League in terms of resources. What's the future of a high performance model in hockey? Are we there right now? Uh, what what do we what what questions do we still need answered? Where's the pendulum swinging right now? That's a great question. Uh, I think we're going to, we're going to get better at asking better questions, more specific questions. I also think we're going to, we're going to progress how we integrate as, um, as an organization, you know, top down, bottom up and, you know, involving, involving every member of the organization um, and utilizing their expertise so I think those, for me, those are the two areas where, where we've made strides, but we can continue to, to make strides. In terms and measures of where we currently are, 
you know, it, it, it would seem, and this is my, my, um, my take, maybe my bias, it would seem right now in terms of high performance hockey, the pendulum is swinging into much more of a measure, 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 and that's fine. But I, I don't know if eventually that pendulum comes back and, 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 and we, we, we're not forgetting the, the, the other elements, the coaching elements, but I don't want to call them soft skills because I think they're hard skills. Um, are we over measuring? And let me be specific. Um, I've asked this question to other, other, other practitioners and coaches. The inputs are really, uh, are much easier to measure, you know, a vertical jump, uh, broad jump, uh, bench press, Yet the most critical measures is a scoreboard score and, and, and the, the other elements that are much, much more difficult to measure, that they take time or they're not measurable. We just can't measure them. Are we in a state right now of over-measuring? Are we relying too much on numbers or do you feel like that's a sweet spot right now? Is it a lack of asking better questions perhaps? It, I think it's it's really hard for me to answer that question, but the key component there is time. I think it it takes time, and you really have to dive, you know, dive into the objective and and digest it, and take time to try and understand it to then figure out what matters and what doesn't, and, and that could change from day to day. But this technology is relatively new, and we've only just scratched the surface of, of, you know, what we can measure and what all this, what, is, what all this data means. So will the pendulum, you know, eventually swing all the way back over? I don't think so. I think it'll swing over a little bit, but I feel like we'll have a better understanding of what it all means. And as you mentioned, we'll be able to ask better questions. Absolutely. The role of the hockey research and development staff with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Could you give us a little deep dive into what that encompasses? Uh, if you're able to share, is is this literally biomechanical research? Is it research in the in the in the applied setting, or is it more theory based? Um, th- that group is is there specifically, you know, to help us with any questions that we have in regards to analytics. Um, oh, yeah. So they get used quite a bit by um, by coaches, by management, and, and provide a very robust package. But we we rely more heavily on our sports scientist who then deals with them. So he's the, the he's the conduit. He's the uh, the gatekeeper for that group. Wow! And so so the that that group would be working more with sports science and and the management. Is that how that would work? Correct. Got it. Uh, you're a young coach. You've got a full head of hair, unlike both you and I now, and you're starting this journey over again. What are, what would you do differently if, if you're now, uh, if you started this journey over again, is there something you wish you learned at that time? Uh, if I, I guess the, the, the overarching question is if you're a young coach, what would you recommend and how to start this journey learning from your mistakes? I would say that the biggest lesson that I learned was um, just to be patient, to be present, and, and to really, not that I wasn't a sponge, but to really soak in all of the information and experience from those around you, those that you're working with, working for, um, as much as you can, and take your time to digest it and don't be in a rush to to progress. It, it's... I remember, you know, it being overwhelming at times with everything that was going on. And uh, so that's why I say from time to time, just stop, take a deep breath and uh, just, just be present. Um, I, I think another one that, uh, that, that probably goes, uh, again, talking to a lot of the, the coaches, practitioners, working in a team environment is, is uh, definitely putting ego aside. You learn from everybody. And uh, the, the faster that you're apart, specifically the individuals I spoke with, I know I talked to Reg Grant and he said empathy might be one of the most important qualities of being a good coach and a good team member. And he, he mentioned his personal experience of, of not just being as a strength coach, but if he could help the athletic therapists out in some capacity, if he could help the equipment guys out in some capacity, you're all a big family and it, it, it goes a long way in working with a team. I would imagine the empathy aspect is, is, is extremely important. 
it's it's a two way street for everybody. So as you mentioned, you know, with the equipment managers, with the strength coaches, you know, whatever we can do to help them, and you know, they do whatever they can to help us. So that's uh, that ebbs and flows. But at the end of the day, we're we're all pulling the rope in the same direction. Right. So, um, you know, you end up doing a lot of things that, uh, you know, they don't necessarily prepare you for um, in university or you don't expect to do as, you know, an athletic therapist. But there's there's a bigger picture. You know, you're a part of something that's bigger than you. So you have to put your ego aside to do what's best for the whole Last question here, and it might go on a little bit uh, if you could expand. Uh, adaptability, I would imagine, is is extremely critical. Adaptability, the last two years we've been in a pandemic. You talk about the map is not the terrain. You talk about plan Bs. This has to be a massive challenge for everything in terms of measures of planning. Obviously, uh, the rules right now, as we speak, this is what, January 24th, are, are games officially back and postponed in in Canada, like in Toronto, or are you able to play a home game? We we are. However, we there are restrictions on on crowd size, um, so that should change hopefully within the next uh, week or so. Uh, but we've we've had a couple of long road trips um, in the U.S. where um, there aren't any restrictions on on crowd size, so. It's uh, the last few years, you know, have been difficult, have been challenging. Uh, that being said, you know, we're extremely fortunate that um, our health and safety is at the forefront, you know, so yep. being tested regularly and um, having the resources to, to remain safe and keep our family safe. So, we can't complain about the situation we're in. Everybody's in the same boat. Um, there are a lot of people out there that um, don't have the same resources or the same luxuries that we do. You know, so it's it's been a difficult time in that sense. You know, um, knowing that there are people, you know, that are less fortunate than us that haven't been able to keep their jobs or um, don't have the resources to, you know, ensure their full, you know, health and safety or the or that of their their families. Awesome. Our guest today has been John Geller. John, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast, my friend. I appreciate it, Anthony. And I uh, always enjoy catching up with you and hope to do it uh, again sometime soon. Thanks, buddy. 